Welcome everybody, we're going to be talking about the effectiveness of international responses in promoting and enforcing human rights. First of all, let me say I'm sorry about the formatting cutting out effectiveness and of right up in that top line. I guess I'm still getting used to this app. Now, if you know everything there is to know about the effectiveness of these responses, you don't need to watch this video. If you're not 100% sure of everything, keep watching on. While the international legal system has been reasonably effective in promoting and publicising uh, protection of human rights, there have been limits to its success in actually providing protection. The failure of the system in protecting human rights has been dramatically shown in the ethnic cleansing campaigns in Rwanda in 1994, Bosnia in 1998, as well as the bloodshed that followed the East, Timor East Timorese vote for independence in 1999, and the continued and ongoing bloodshed in parts of Western Africa, including the Sudan. Some of the limits to the effectiveness of international law in protecting of human rights are... Not all countries are party to human rights treaties. So, individuals in those countries which are not party to the treaties are not protected by those treaties at all. However, many would argue that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has the force of customary law and therefore binds all nations whether or not they are party to human rights treaties. A state may also be obliged to protect human rights within its own territory solely by reason of its membership of the United Nations and its acceptance of its obligations under the United Nations Charter. We also have a lack of adequate enforcement mechanisms. The enforcement mechanisms of the United Nations and its bodies, which include hearing complaints and conducting investigations, do not apply to all human rights treaties and some of them are optional rather than compulsory, depending on which treaty is being implemented. Even if a nation has agreed to a treaty, it may not have agreed to the enforcement mechanisms of that treaty. For example, Australia has not agreed to enforcement mechanisms under the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or the CEDAW for short. Many states have been slow to report to the relevant committees even when they have agreed to do so. Enforcement by consensus. Now, enforcement of any international law is problematic because it relies on consensus. Recip reciprocity of, and notions of legal responsibility. Nations do not always feel compelled by these reasons to follow international law. Reliance on state reporting. The Human Rights Council, with its universal periodic review program, for example, relies on each member state to ac accurately report its own human rights infringements and the actions it takes towards addressing them. This reliance on state reporting means states who do not wish to comply can simply choose not to report certain situations. There is also a lack of Security Council action. Now, the Security Council has only used the powers of humanitarian intervention four times, and each time to varying degrees. In the former Yugoslavia in 1991, Somalia in 1993, Rwanda in 1994, and East Timor in 1999. In fact, the UN Security Council did not sufficiently intervene to stop mass genocide in Rwanda in 1994 and was widely criticised by the media, NGOs and others for, al for allowing known ethnic cleansing to happen by non-interference. It was this inadequate intervention which directly led to the development of the responsibility to protect, or in brackets, the R2P in brackets principles. Generally speaking, the UN Security Council has proved to be extremely wary of intervening to stop human rights abuses occurring in sovereign states, despite the existence of the humanitarian intervention and R2P principles. War crimes tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia represent a willingness by the international community to create structures to enforce human rights in times of war. 
However, the effectiveness of the tribunals is hampered by the fact that they may actually help entrench the conflict rather than end it. Other gross violations of human rights have also been committed in times of war in recent years. Think of Afghanistan recently. And similar structures have been instituted to deal with these. It was hoped that the establishment of the International Criminal Court in 2002 would improve the enforcement of human rights in cases where abuse amounts to crimes against humanity. But the court has not made any major impact to date. There has been a lack of funding. The United Nations has established many specialist international organisations which have a role in protecting human rights. For example, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR, was established in 1951 and has the role of providing international protection to refugees. Like all United Nations organisations, human rights organisations suffer from a chronic lack of funding which hampers their ability to be fully effective. The informal recognition of NGOs is another consideration. The reporting procedures of nations to UN bodies have been criticised because it is argued that they do not provide unbiased information. NGOs can and do provide independent information to the UN. However, the role in reporting human rights violations to international organisations has been informal. A more formalised recognition of NGOs in this area is needed for the impact to be fully effective. And lastly, effectiveness of the media. The media is effective because it can quickly mobilise public action against human rights abuses. Public action can call upon the governments and international organisations to uphold human rights. NGOs are also able to use the media to gain access to the public. However, the media is all-consuming and 24-hour news channels and access to constant news over the internet mean that the general public can quickly get compassion fatigue from being exposed to too many horrors via the media. The news can present a human rights abuse and, once the initial outcry has subsided, the story may then be ignored. The media also has a tendency to be broad story but not deep in its coverage. So while the public knows about the what of the situation, it knows very little about the why. Well guys, I hope that has helped you as a bit of an overview for the effectiveness of international responses in promoting and enforcing human rights. If there are any parts that you did not fully understand or you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks guys.